The sample-based quantum diagonalization method, or SQD for short, is a quantum classical hybrid algorithm like Krylov quantum diagonalization, KQD, like VQE, and many others. In using such hybrid algorithms, it may be useful to think about where each algorithm leverages quantum and classical computing. Recall that VQE creates states on a quantum circuit using classically optimized parameters. In that case, the state itself is on a quantum computer, though obtaining the target state is a process that combines both classical and quantum computing. The expectation value of the operator is calculated using quantum measurements, but some classical combining of terms is also necessary. In contrast, SQD uses a quantum computer to generate a useful subspace onto which the Hamiltonian or other operator can be projected. The Hamiltonian is then diagonalized entirely classically to find the target eigenstate. Suppose we have a problem of interest to science or industry that can be cast as an eigensolver problem on a matrix of n rows and n columns. Suppose further that n is large enough that exact classical diagonalization is not an option. It would clearly be advantageous to reduce the dimensions of our matrix while preserving all the relevant features of the ground state. Indeed, that is the goal of many approximate eigensolver approaches, including classical Krylov methods. Let's assume that we know enough about our problem to make a reasonably good guess about the form of the ground state, but not enough to solve the problem outright. In that case, we could make many measurements of our fair approximation of the target ground state. The results of these measurements give us a subspace of computational basis states that contain all the relevant components of our ground state. Projecting onto that subspace would yield a smaller matrix that still contains the relevant degrees of freedom. The workflow for this is as follows. You start by choosing a good ansatz. More precisely, choose an ansatz whose support coincides with that of the target eigenstate. We'll discuss exactly what that means. Next, measure the state in the computational basis, as is done with the sampler primitive. Then, use the results of the sampling to define a subspace that contains the ground state. Then project your matrix onto that subspace. Finally, diagonalize the smaller projected matrix classically. Let's pick apart each of these steps, paying special attention to defining the subspace. Throughout all of quantum computing, choosing a good ansatz is always critical. In the case of SQD, your choice of ansatz will determine what computational basis states may be measured in the sampling. The true ground state can be expressed as a superposition of some subset of computational basis states. That subset is called the support of the ground state. To get a good estimate of your ground state and its energy, your ansatz must have a non-zero projection onto the computational basis states in the support of the ground state. This diagram represents the space spanned by all possible states on the number of qubits being used. We want an ansatz with support that contains the support of the true ground state. Consider a very small example system with a ground state of psi ground is 0.8 times the state 100 plus 0.6 times the state 001. This has support made of those two vectors, 100 and 001. Let's say the ansatz is of the form psi ansatz 1 is a times the state 100 plus b times the state 010 plus c times the state 001, so that its support is the set of three vectors 100, 010, and 001, a superset of the support of the ground state. This is a good ansatz. Now imagine that we had instead chosen an ansatz of the form psi ansatz 2 is a times the state 110 plus b times the state 011. This has support made of those two vectors 110 and 011, which has no overlap with the support of the ground state. This is a bad ansatz. Note that we do not necessarily require that the ansatz be a good approximation of the ground state. The ansatz could have much larger support, or the coefficients could be very different on the ansatz and the true ground state and still work well. At this stage, we've used a well-motivated ansatz to make the quantum computer 
adopt the state similar to our target state. Shown here is the unitary coupled JASTRO, or UCJ ansatz, which is very useful in quantum chemistry. We now want to measure the state of the system obtaining bit strings describing the collapsed state of each qubit. Recall that Hamiltonian estimation, as in VQE, requires many quantum measurements. This is partly to reduce uncertainty and partly due to the number of groups of commuting Pauli's that make up the Hamiltonian. In sampling methods, you still need lots of measurements, but the reasons are different. Now we need many measurements to effectively sample the many computational basis states involved in highly entangled quantum states. In SQD, the sampled bit strings correspond to configurations of the simulated system. If the system being studied is subject to absolute constraints like conservation laws in physics or chemistry, then most of the measured states will be valid but some sampled bit strings correspond to invalid or non-physical configurations due to noise and errors. A process called configuration recovery aims to refine these noisy samples into a set of more accurate configurations. This process involves generating new configurations by probabilistically flipping individual bits based on averaged orbital occupancies and known particle numbers. The refined configurations are then used to span subspaces for Hamiltonian projection and diagonalization, iteratively improving the fidelity of the quantum state representation. Let's look at a trivially small example of configuration recovery to understand its meaning. Suppose we measure a quantum system with four qubits, representing four molecular orbitals, and obtain the following bit strings from the quantum processor. Each bit string represents the occupancy of an orbital, one for occupied, zero for unoccupied. Qiskit uses a notation in which the least significant qubit is on the far right. For example, 1010 indicates that orbitals 1 and 3 are occupied. These measurements have been chosen for pedagogical reasons only. The resulting occupancies may not match a physical system. In physical contexts, it is often the case that the system has a known total number of particles. There also may be other conservation laws that you can leverage to determine the physicality of a measured state. To stay concrete, let's assume our system is known to have a total particle number of n equals 2. This tells us the total number of ones that should appear in our state label, which is called a Hamming weight constraint. However, some measured configurations violate this constraint. The state 1010 is physically valid, but the state 1110 has too many particles, and the state of all zeros has too few particles, zero in fact. These violations can be due to noise in the system or errors in measurement. We need a way to get back to configurations that make physical sense, at least in an approximate way. This is called configuration recovery. To correct our noisy samples, we probabilistically flip bits in invalid configurations based on the average orbital occupancy averaged over valid configurations. Orbital occupancies are the expectation values of the number operator acting on each orbital. This is estimated and refined self-consistently using the states produced from SQD. Let's look at orbital 2, for example. In two of the four valid configurations, orbital 2 was occupied. This gives us an expected occupancy of 0.5. We do the same for the other three orbitals. Now we return to an invalid configuration, 1110. We can flip one of the bits from 1 to 0 to generate a valid configuration, but which one should we flip? One way of deciding is through the deviation of each orbital's occupancy from the averages we just calculated. Here we see that the biggest difference is in the occupation of orbital 1, so we might expect that bit 1 should be flipped from a 1 to a 0. Of course, orbital 2 is not far behind, and it's always possible, however unlikely, that this measured state is the result of multiple errors on the same state. Choosing only the largest deviation from mean for all invalid states is not optimal. Instead, bits are flipped probabilistically with the probability being a function of the differences shown here. Let us suppose that in this case, we do change the bit that differs the most from the average occupation. 
So 1110 becomes 1100. We would do the same process for the other invalid choice. Let's say that in this case, we end up flipping bits 1 and 3. After this correction process, we have a new set of configurations that might look like this. Using this refined set, we can update the average orbital occupancy to improve fidelity. In our case, the new occupancies are these. This iterative recovery process ensures that noisy measurements are filtered into physically meaningful configurations, improving the accuracy of eigenstate approximations in SQD. The SQD Qiskit add-on has some tools that will be instrumental in this process. If we've done a good job sampling the states in the support of the true ground state of the system, then we should be able to look at only the parts of the Hamiltonian that act on this subspace and still obtain a good ground state and energy. In our trivially small four qubit example, there are initially two to the four or 16 possible states of the system. Using a combination of sampling and configuration recovery, we reduce this to three states in our subspace of interest, three states that we hope make up the support of the true ground state. We now project our full Hamiltonian onto that subspace. That is, we make a matrix M out of a column of vectors from our recovered sampled subspace and an analogous one, M dagger, out of the rows, and we multiply M dagger H M. Pictorially, this means taking the matrix elements in the rows and columns corresponding to the states in our recovered sampled subspace. The highlighted rows and columns are those corresponding to our subspace, and the darker highlighted boxes where they overlap are the elements that we keep for our new projected matrix. Now that we have selected out the subspace of interest, we can diagonalize this matrix on a classical computer using a standard eigensolver. If the true ground state is comprised entirely of states in our subspace, this diagonalization should yield the correct ground state and ground state energy. If we merely have most of the ground state support, we may get close. Once we've obtained the ground state for this projected Hamiltonian, we have a very useful state from which to calculate the average occupancy of each orbital. Previously, our occupancies were calculated from states that we sampled using an ansatz that we hoped would help us approach our ground state. But there was no guarantee that the average occupancy of each orbital from that sampling corresponded to the occupancy in the lowest energy state. Let's back up. We had a sampling of computational states. We used configuration recovery to correct any that were physically invalid. Then we calculated the average orbital occupancy using all of them. The ground state might only include some of them, the ground state of this projected Hamiltonian may not be the true ground state of our original system, but it is the lowest energy state that can be created using any superposition of the recovered states in our subspace. The orbital occupancy of this state will yield an energy less than or equal to the energy of the occupancy obtained from the recovered space. So this occupancy is a better estimate of our ground state occupancy. We can repeat the configuration recovery process using this new occupancy, and we can iterate this until our convergence criteria are met. Sample-based quantum diagonalization is fast compared to other near-term algorithms like VQE. It's more scalable, and it is robust to noise and errors in sampling. It does still require that we prepare a good ansatz with a large projection onto the support of the true ground state of our system. If nothing at all is known about our true ground state, SQD may need to be used in conjunction with other methods to first learn about the ground state and iteratively approach it. SQD plays a critical role in the emerging suite of classical quantum hybrid algorithms and is one of the greatest drivers toward useful quantum computing.